the smell of grass and leather There were days when we'd play too We'd cross the lines when the sun would shine And make our dreams come true I had a glove on my hand and a girl in the stands She stole my heart like a hit and run It seems the world was so much simpler back then we was just out there for fun I pray for someone to hold your hand And baseball in the summer Someone to walk with you When this world grows cold Baseball in the summer Baseball in the summer Welcome to the Brock v. Mac Legendary Rivals podcast, and here we have a really interesting uh, guest with us, Jeff Knapp, uh, a, a legendary badger, but someone whose roots are firmly planted in McMaster's uh, home uh, region. So someone I think I know that Don Graves was pissed that you chose Brock over McMaster. Um, you know, make but... decisions. <laughs> Jeff Knapp, welcome. Uh, how are you doing these days? Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the shout out. Yeah, doing very well. Um, plugging away. Got a uh, a busy life with work and and coaching baseball again. Can't can't turn it off, right? Once you you get into the ball stuff, you just keep doing that. So between baseball, work, family, yeah, keeping me busy. All the, all different aspects. It's amazing. You know, I think we've done now. 30, 31 cat, podcasts between Brock and McMaster. And I think everybody except me is coaching. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Every time you go to step down, they, they just keep pulling you back in. And you keep, you know to it, so. Do you crank out that Godfather 3 line every time yeah, that happens? Yeah, yeah. pull you back in. That's for sure. <laughs> so, Jeff, um, you know, we'll obviously get to your career at Brock and your baseball career here, but um, – Tell us, you know, I think I've kind of alluded to it, but um, where you grew up and, you know, kind of how you turned into an athlete as a kid. How do you develop a love for different sports? So we've had a few people that are into, we're really into hockey and baseball that mix, yeah. um, including Coach McRae was kind of like that. But yeah, um, tell me a little bit about your formative years as an athlete and a, as a fan of baseball. Nice. Well, I grew up on the... Uh on the Hamilton mountain, uh, not far from Burning Harbor stadium. So, um, I remember as a, as a kid, probably seven, eight, nine years old, we had the, uh, the Hamilton Redbirds at the time. It was, a they were a, an affiliate with the Cardinals and, uh, that Burning Harbor stadium used to just be packed all the time, right? Tons of big crowds and me and my buddies would go up there and, and all the foul balls into the parking lot, we'd go and chase them down and, um, saw a lot of, big league players come through that park, you know, kind of on their, on their upswing. And, and um, so I kind of got involved, you know, really had that passion for baseball early. I have an older brother and sister that both uh, played baseball all growing up. And, and it's funny, we were never, we were never a, a typical, you know, hockey family in Canada. I never played hockey. My brother and sister never played hockey. Uh, we were always kind of baseball in the summer and basketball in the winter. That was kind of our, our passion and, and you know my parents will talk about it still when I was a young kid you know they'd take us to the park and I'd be four years old watching my brother and sister play baseball and I think I just you know found that that love for the game at such an early age and then as I got you know older um, that was definitely my passion and the other sports I played you know kind of tailed off and as I got in my mid-teens I I really kind of focused on baseball and uh, yeah and just to this day, she's 47 years old and still have that love for it. Right. So that's super cool. I, you know, people are so influenced by their, their siblings or their parents, you know, and I think it's great that you're, you know, it's always great when I, like, I think you see a, a, an athlete whose sister, you know, was a great athlete, you know, it's hard to, 
it's it's hard to live up when you got an older brother who's really good, but it's yeah. super hard, I think, when your sister kicks your ass at a lot of things, right? Yeah, so. well, they, well, they probably both kicked my ass when I was younger, <laughs> that's for sure. They were both, uh, I won't tell them that or I won't admit to that, but yeah, they were both. My brother was a hell of a ball player, so uh, yeah, and he's five, five, six years older than me, so I was always uh, trying to, you know, be good enough to play with him and, and hang out at the park when he was playing, you know, 17, 18 U, and I'm that 13-year-old kid, you know, pitching the dugout and just being a, a ball rat. Right. So it's amazing. So did you, you start into um, like rep ball or organ? Was there an organized baseball yeah, that you started in? Yeah. Hamilton was a bit, it was a lot of kind of house league centers. And then as you got, as we got to be about uh, 16 is when Hamilton kind of did a whole reorg and kind of affiliated themselves with the IBL teams and, uh, and kind of got into a, a rep program. Right. So, uh, that would have been 16U, 17. At that time, it was all called midget and bantam or whatever the, the terminology was. And then, yeah, about 16, started playing, you know, rep ball. Um, our high school ball was was pretty competitive. There's a lot of a lot of guys that played with me at Brock, came from Hamilton. And so when we would have, you know, high school games, it was usually our rep team and everybody was kind of playing against each other, right? It was usually very competitive games and you know, a lot of yours, your buddies, but you're playing against them. So a lot of chirping and, and shit talking. But, um, so yeah, really competitive. And, and, and then kind of that, uh, into the junior years of, you know, 17, 18, 19 up to that way. So yeah, it was a good, uh, part of OBA, you know, still we played with the Coba loop, central Ontario. And, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun, a lot of good memories all over the place, tournaments and things like that. So yeah, it was a good, really good experience. And what position were you playing? Like uh, that, I mean, I know that you've played a couple of different positions, yeah. but uh, what, that where time were... I was, I was more third base, uh, a little bit of shortstop out of necessity. I'm not that I'm ever going to claim that I was a great defensive ball player, but uh, um, played a little bit of short, but mostly third base, first base, kind of corner infield guy. And um, yeah, at that time, I mean, when, when we were 16, 17, 18, we might have had 12 kids on the roster and we'd always have one or two kids away. So it seemed like a lot of our games, we would have nine or 10 kids, right? And it was, you know, hey, go play a little bit of outfield here and there. But yeah, I would say, you know, kind of third base corner and field were kind of my okay. positions at that time. And, uh, you know, so let's go back to the, you know, high school that's got to be fun because oh, yeah. uh, you're playing guys that you're going to meet up with in the summer. And I've had that experience as well. Um, but one of the best dynamics is if you have a friend who's a pitcher and then you, you take an at bat, have any of those experiences where you, you yep. they either got you or you got them good. Yeah. So, uh, a good friend of mine that I played ball with all growing up, Drew Arnold that went to Brock for a long time and, uh, and he went to Hill Park and I went to Sherwood and, and they were kind of the, you know, the two top high school teams kind of growing up and, and we battled a lot and, and, um, you know, a lot of chirping and, and Drew had some, uh, you know, typical left-handed pitcher, a little bit weird, a little bit weird delivery and, and kind of funky on the mound. And, uh, I never could handle him beep, whether it was BP, I remember, you know, batting practice and he'd be throwing a side session or something and say, you know, let's go step in and, 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 you know, give me 10 or 12 pitches. Let's see what I can do. Right. And never really squared him up. He always kind of had that weird, uh, funky delivery and I just never could never could handle them. Right. And, and, uh, yeah, but a lot of good battles. That was our, you know, that was kind of we'll, we'll, we'll do, you know, Drew's out, out in Lindsay now and, yeah. uh, teaching, but you know, I think he and I'll have an interesting conversation because we'll just see just, you know, I think we're probably peas out of the same pod, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think the thing with left-handed pitchers and I, I say it is because everything is a little bit unorthodox and it's hard to, but the other thing, you know, that's always strange for a hitter, but I think it's just been my experience and I played until I was 36. So that's a long, wow. long, long list of uh, teams there. Left-handers don't throw a ball that's straight a lot. I don't see a lot of straight fastballs, you know, no. the, the stuff moves and it's just a little bit different. And because with a right-hander that comes straight over the top, they've got to really work hard to get movement on the ball they got to cut it or whatever it's yeah. just kind of a natural motion out of a lot of lefties and so it, it just moves differently than what you see most of the time so i think people have a hard time with it well i like to i always kind of you know bust drew's balls a little bit that if he wasn't a 
if it wasn't a pitcher, he wouldn't wouldn't have done That's anything cool. else because you know he wasn't the uh, wasn't the most athletic guy. And I, you know, I still see him all the time, and we golf. And uh, I remember one time we went to, uh, um, I think they had like an intramural pickup basketball game, and uh, at Brock. So we went over, and Grant Giffen was there, and maybe Bottomley. I can't remember. It was a handful of guys there, and we watched Drew play pickup basketball, and and it was like he never. Never picked up a ball, and, and I remember Giffen was just giving it to him and giving it to him, right? And, and we still bust his balls to this day, right? About, um, but he could pitch. He could pitch. There's no doubt about it. He was a great pitcher, and we used to just kill because he always wanted to, you know, get his at bats and let me. Oh, let me take some swings, and we just always said to him, Drew, stick to pitching, bro. You're that. I needed to have a conversation with him, but you know, I think that. Uh... I never wanted to hit because I had hit people with the ball. Yeah. I, I, I frequently admit this, that I had a little bit of a reputation for being mean and to expose me to hitting, I would have ended up with every second pitch right, in, right in the square of the back because it yeah. just would have been payback for other stuff I'd done. So exactly. Um, Drew clearly is a sucker for punishment or didn't throw inside enough, you know, one of the two, but. Yeah, he 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 was that nice guy in the mound, right? He always had that calm composure and hard to fire him up. Well, that's good. I you know, like you can only succeed one of two ways, I think, and and it's it's either that or you got to be like me, a, a a bull that's ready to charge constantly. And I think people get caught in the middle. They really they really struggle. So so you're playing, you know, obviously in Hamilton. How does Brock come onto the radar? And and you know, I. I you and I had a conversation before we went on. I know that you were given a recruiting letter that uh, Coach McRae had sent out, but mm. um, maybe from your perspective, what led you choosing Brock? And were you, what other schools were you looking at, or were you looking stateside? Because you know, I know that you're a pretty well-known power hitter at this point. Um, yeah. So we, um, yeah, at that point, I was. So that would have been. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really sure. I was kind of keeping a lot of options open and. Uh, Received a letter from McRae, and unfortunately, I never played for McRae. He he left that following year, so I never actually got the chance to play with him and or play for him. Um, but I knew a few of the guys that had co- uh, played under McRae, Ron Strau. Um, I knew Bottomley a little bit, right? So they had. So I talked to Ron a little bit, just uh, kind of the experience, and and he had nothing but positive to say about the program and 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 playing under McRae. So I kind of was kind of kicking around the back of my head and um I went to a tournament in uh actually was in St. Catharines uh with our junior team at the time and had a uh was on a bit of a hot streak and had a a pretty uh pretty awesome tournament and just kind of lit it up at the plate and and that's where I first met Daryl Kemp and I think everybody probably on this podcast that does it knows Kemp at some some form or fashion or at least you know the name right and uh yeah, had a had a really good tournament, um, and the team we were playing against, uh, can't remember where they're somewhere down in uh, Missouri, and they were up here, and their coach um, was the coach of a JUCO in Missouri, so I was kind of, you know, bantering the idea of going down there and and doing a tour, but it was a JUCO, and it was kind of in the middle of Missouri, in the middle of nowhere, and um, you know, after talking to Camp and uh, my coach at the time back in Hamilton, uh, Danny Williams, who's um, since passed away. Um, he was a Kansas City Royal Scout at the time, and uh, I really looked up to Danny. He was a hard nose, no nonsense, bullshit kind of coach, and, and in your face. And at that time, you know, I kind of had that chat with Don, Danny, and, and you know, wanted his input and and uh, his kind of two cents was, you know, stay local. You're going to get the playing time. And after talking to Kemp a lot, I kind of felt like. Um, you know, I'd get more playing time at Brock and, and better chance to, you know, if I went down south, where do you fit on the, you know, the pecking order? And, and um, yeah, so t- met with Kemp a few times, met Lounsbury and, um, and then going back and, and talking to Drew, who I was good buddies with. And, um, yeah, he kind of was saying, yeah, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go to Brock and, and just kind of that chatter back and forth. I think it was just, it was meant to be right. And, uh, decided on Brock and, um, never really looked into Mac. That was kind of uh it was always kind of Brock or, or, or head down South. Those were kind of my options and, and, uh, yeah. And off I went. So no looking back. It is, it's, it's, 
you know, I, I don't think that is something that is stressed enough to Canadians. Um, you know, a lot of times there are opportunities in the U S but if you don't play, you're not going to get any better. Uh, you might get better in practice, but you know, none of us want to go to a team where you're a practice, you know, your filler for practice. And, yeah. um, well, that's you know, why I see with you a lot of the, a lot of the kids I coach now that are, you know, 17, 18, you, and they're looking at the States and they're looking at Canadian schools. And, you know, when I talk to them, I say, you, you, you have to go to a program that where you're going to play because it, it doesn't do any good to go to some school in the States and, and you're the third string, third baseman. Like what's that going to do for you? Right. You're just going to get frustrated and pissed off. So you have to pick a, a program that fits you, right. That you're going to be able to keep playing or, or you're just going to get frustrated and you'll be gone with it. Right. So, and I really try to like instill that in the boys. Hey, you've got to go to a program that fits and, and where you can play and you can compete. Right. So that yeah. was always a big factor in it. It's amazing. And, and so you, you did, were you in residence at Brock or were you commuting in from Hamilton? What, no, I was uh, in residence. Yeah. It was uh first year I was on uh, well, the village. I'm not sure what it's called now, but, um, so I lived with Drew. I lived with Mike Whitehead, who was on the team. And then we had a fourth roommate that wasn't a ball player. That was a uh, poor guy. He was a little bit uh, in shock, I suspect. A little bit shocked. There were the, the us three come in, and then and we met him. And um, and then in our village, uh, Grant Giffen was in our in our area. And uh, so yeah, we lived in uh, village first year, and then my second year, I lived off campus. So um, yeah, I had a had a blast in the village and met a lot of great people. Yeah, the villages was at that time clearly the best of the residents. Although the queue was okay, but it was, um, you know, if you were stuck at the the downtown can the downtown residence or yeah. uh, the Queenston residence was the worst of the bunch. That was the old hospital yeah. thing where you had to take, you know, um, that would have allowed you to really enjoy the experience of being at the university on top of the baseball. Right? There's oh yeah, was it was a structure. It was great, and it kind of seemed like our our unit in the village was kind of that headquarters for when we wanted to go out. Right. Cause a lot of the second year guys were living off campus. So um, a lot of them would come to our place and that's where we'd, you know, maybe have a few uh, beverages before heading out. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was great. We, we had a, a really great experience there. And I, like I said, I wouldn't change it for a second. So. I had three ball. Pl- I mean, look, I, I was in a house that had four, three, three, a couple ball players and a two. So um, the question is, of course, who was the neat freak? Who was not the neat freak? And, uh, you know, how big were the scrambles when you heard that someone fo- someone's folks were coming for a visit? You had to yeah. quickly clean it up, eh? I can tell you that uh, I can tell you that Mike Whitehead was not the cleanest guy in the world. And he, <laughs> he used to, we all we all dipped. We all we all had our our lips in and uh and I still remember Mike used to have, when you went to Dairy Queen at the time, you used to get the little mini um, ball helmets. You know, they put your Sunday in the helmet. Yeah. And Mike had one of those little cups and well, he had probably a handful of them. And, and at any given time, anywhere in the house, we'd find one of these little mini helmets filled up to the rim with, oh. with spitting it. Right. And we kept saying to Mike, just throw it out or flush it down the toilet or do something with it. Right. You're not saving that for something, but we found these little spit cups all over the house. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, definitely a few uh, a few arguments over the spit cups and uh, yeah, but we got along. It was, I mean, it's good. Yeah, none of us were were too too bad to live with. I don't think, anyways. But do you remember what uh, what you were taking in terms of classes? I took a communications, kind of a general BA, and uh, you know, and I, I laugh about it. And my daughter just started Queens, and my son's in grade eleven, and you know, I kind of say, yeah, I went to Brock, and I was enrolled at Brock, but. You know, class and class was always kind of secondary, right? I went for the for the baseball and to have fun and meet people, and and you know, I was only eighteen when I started, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was kind yeah. of you know flying by the seat of my pants at that point, and and uh, so I took communications, took a bunch of classes, and uh, you know, but I never, you know, I tell my kids all the time, I didn't apply myself, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't go into that you know, fully prepared for the, for the university, for the, the academic side of it anyways. Right. So. Yeah. And I think, look, that's a lot of people's university experience, but it, it then maybe sets you on the right road at a certain point. Cause you've got to wake up from that, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of life. So just tell me a little bit about, you know, how you come to be on the team. So, 
obviously at this point you've met with uh, Lounsbury and Kemp a few times. They've they've seen your um, super hot streak at a, a tournament, a local tournament. So they're probably salivating, knowing Lounsbury is probably pretty excited about it. Um, and you got some friends on the team or that are joining the team. How is it that you come to be on the team? And and uh, tell me a little bit about this, you know, the start of the season or the training camp that you go to. Yeah, so, um, you know, a couple met with Kemp and Lansbury a couple times over, you know, over the next few months and kind of kept in touch with them and um, and uh, went down to uh, uh, kind of a workout with a lot of the first year guys. And, and I remember there being about 10 or 15 and, and I don't remember actually being kind of like a, you know, a full tryout, if you will. It was more of a, a workout and kind of put us through the, the ringers and, you know, do a bit of, you know, times and, and ground balls and BP and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I felt like they had a pretty good understanding of who they wanted. And, and um, so there was a few there that, you know, that didn't make the team and, and went down to this, you know, tryout, if you will. And, and um, yeah, it fared pretty well. And, and uh you know, join the team and, uh, and then moving forward, getting into the, you know, the year that I went to Brock, um, we had a, uh, went down middle, middle of August, middle third week of August and had kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a spring training, if you will, kind of a couple of weeks before school got in and, and went down and kind of got to meet all the guys and, you know, getting down there and then seeing, you know, Matt Fletcher who I'd played against and, and Paul Matecki who I'd played against and, these guys, other guys from the Hamilton area that were, you know, really good ball players, and now here I am, you know, teammates with these guys, and and um, yeah, this was a great experience. And then, you know, I remember those two weeks of training camp were they were a grind, you know, two practices a day and and working out, and and uh, and I don't know whether Lounsbury had kind of taken that from McRae, but the conditioning was, you know, that was a big thing. So a lot of you know, intense workouts and just getting up to speed and, and uh, yeah. And then we, we kind of hit the ground running in the, in September. So. Yeah. The, the two days are brutal. There's no doubt about it. And conditioning is a huge part of the, or at least is a huge part of the culture there. So that was eye opening for a lot of yeah. players who were used to kind of standard rep practices where you would run a few foul poles, you know, take a BP, shag some balls and the pitchers might throw a bullpen session. It's much mm -hmm. different from that perspective. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to do a little Daryl Kemp impression here because I, I feel that this was probably either mentioned to you or you got to you through osmosis. He's probably like, hey, Nap, Nap, come here. You know, uh, you're replacing a guy named Hoover who was really good at third. You know that, right? <laughs> Did you know that you were having to, <laughs> having to step in for a, a really great player in Jeff Hoover? Yeah, yeah, I'd heard uh I'd heard lots of that. I heard lots of uh lots of talk about Jeff Hoover and and uh you know, never never met him, but I I I'd heard he was kind of a stud ball player and then went down to the states and uh yeah, Kemp didn't uh never really mince words, you know, just told it straight the way it was. This is a, we <laughs> like it or don't like it. This is the way it is, right? And uh you know, and they always had the uh always had the lipper going and and uh yeah, Kemp was, uh, he was a beauty, just really, uh, I really took a liking to him and, and he was, uh, he was a big influence definitely in my career there at Brock for sure. Yeah. Coach Kemp, uh, just looks like a ball player, right? He's got, everything looks like a ball player and, and feels like a ball player. And, um, but you know, you're in trouble when he says, Hey, and then your name follows, right? I ever, and whenever yeah. I would hear that, I would like start sprinting in the opposite direction. Cause I knew yeah. some sort of zinger was coming and then usually he'd spit on the top of my cleats, you know? Right. I always, I always tell, I tell my son and I tell the guys I played with, you know, what a good ball player camp was and a coach. And I, and I tell them a story about the first home run I hit at Brock and here I am, you know, trotting around the bases and I'm, happier than a pig and shit. I'm so excited. And, you know, I've just hit my first home run and I'm rounding the bases and I get in the dugout and, you know, high five this and that. And, and Kemp kind of calls me over and that impression, he just kind of pulls me off to the side and he says, Hey, like, never, Hey, well done. But he says, you know, your hands were a little slow through here. And I think, you know, I think you still got an extra 10, 15 feet on that ball. If we can, you know, tweak the swing a little bit. And he was always, 
trying to coach, and here I am thinking – Holy shit! Like I just hit my first university home run, and I'm ecstatic, <laughs> and and just deflate that balloon. But that was kind of always kind of pushing yeah. you to, yeah, hey, that was a great, you, you know, you hit that 350, whatever, we can hit it 365. Just, and it was always that that coaching in them, and, and you know, you you either like that style or you didn't. And I loved it. I loved that being pushed and 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 uh, kind of always wanting to get better. And and um, yeah, but that was that was my kind of first real taste of camp, like, holy shit, this guy, you know, means business, right? So. Yeah. That's great. It's, uh, it's, it's classic, right? Like he just, but he would also say really nice things like uh, away from the team, you know, he'd pull you off from the team and say, Hey, yeah. you pitched you a great game or, you know, that was a great at bat, you know, those kinds of things. Um, because yeah. I think there's, he just has a real good touch of understanding the ways to, push the buttons to get the best out yeah. of people. I was, yeah. I always found too, like with, you know, when I played and, and even now when I in coaching and, and we go against other teams and I always think when you bump into guys that played at that high level that, that Kemp did, I, I feel like it almost makes them better coaches because they don't worry about all the small stuff and they've been there, they've done that and they kind of, they bring that clout with them. Right. So I find, you know, that, they're, they're better coaches in that respect. They don't, they don't worry about all the little bullshit drama that's off to the side. They're just, they're there for baseball. They've seen it, you know, 10,000 ball games and they've seen a million kids play ball and they just, they, they understand the game, right. As opposed to a guy that's kind of like an X's and O's that has never really played at a high level, but they read the book and they, that they think that makes them a good coach. Right. And, and it's, to me, it's totally different. You've, you've played the game. You, you kind of get that respect. Right. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's hard leading young players because they notice those things. You know, we're not so young that we're like blindly going to buy into somebody. You got to prove it a little bit, or at least have the the feel of a big time coach. If you're going to be coaching players who've performed in big time situations and played in some pretty big programs, so it's yep, it's hard. You know, credibility is just something you sense as a ball player. Yeah, sure. uh, well, that's we, what I was telling you before yeah. we we went online about you know, kind of that chirping back and forth with Kemp and, and the one day kind of saying to him, Hey, let's, let's go. You, you know, you talk a lot, let's step in the cage and let's see what you can do. And I think he hit a line drive to center the first one. And then I think five of the next six, he hit a couple moonshots out of the park. Right. So that alone, you're thinking, yep, you, you, you've kind of got that quote, right? <laughs> yeah. He, but I mean, I think, you know, I think you guys are kind of, you know, it's kind of fun to hear that you guys would have thrown that gauntlet down in front of him. I, I had yeah. played with him, so I knew better. You know, at a certain point, you're kind of like, man, I, I hope someone doesn't step up and get in Daryl's face because it's not going to end well. I did it, and I it didn't end well for me. And, and well, when I say uh, we, it probably wasn't me that did it because I was kind of the first year. Right, it was probably Tennish or uh, or Colin or Tyler or something like that. Right, but uh, I could see that those been me chirping them. <laughs> I could see those guys doing it too. They yeah. just have that kind of a a, a fun thing. Yeah, so for- let me ask you this. Um, what are your reflections on Coach Briggs Jew? Do you have a lot of uh, interaction with with Wayne? And what do you feel? What are your memories of, of Wayne Briggs Jew as a coach? Uh, Wayne was just he was the older guy, the older coach on the team, and and was always you know that positive reinforcement. So he was always the guy that you know if Lounsbury gave us shit for something, Wayne was always there to kind of pick you back up, right, and say it's okay, like you know, and. Um, yeah, just always optimistic and, and, you know, encouraging. And, and even when things were, were down or you're playing like shit, he was always right there trying to motivate you and, and build you back up. Right. And, um, you know, I think the coaching staff as a whole had a good dynamics of that, right. You had the, you always got to have that hard ass that, that yells and screams and, and, and you always got to have that other coach that kind of, you know, can pull you aside and, and dust you off and pick you back up and say, you know, it's good to go. You'll be fine. And then Wayne was definitely that guy. He was just, you know, older guy, a little more experience had been around. And, and yeah, that was his demeanor, right? Just rocking the greatest mustache ever. Oh, you know, it's, it. <laughs> it but I, I, I think it's a great before dynamic. Before mustaches were cool back, before mustaches oh, yeah. came to this fashion too. He's the OG of mustache, right? He's 100%. like, I've been wearing this since I was probably 15 years old and yep. it's never coming off. Yep. And, uh, 
Oh yeah, he does. <laughs> yep. I, I just had uh, dinner with him uh, two days ago, so it's yeah. just still his voice is always the same. He's consistent. I always think. I, I don't think I've run into a Brock player where if you say the name Wayne Briggs Jew that they don't start smiling. You know, they yeah. just kind of have this feeling about the guy. And, um, it was also, like your, he was like your dad. He was like your like a yeah. fatherly figure, right? He was kind of like your dad, your grandfather, and you just didn't want to. You know, it was that that whole I don't want to let him down. I don't want to. Yeah. And and he just had that demeanor, and it was it was awesome. Yeah, it would be really weird because he's an umpire, right? So, yeah. like, it would be really strange to play in a game where he was umpiring and disagreed with a call because you just wouldn't – he'd be the one umpire where you'd be like, oh, I so want to just curse at him <laughs> or I want to get tossed and I can't. It's Wayne, you know? It yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You also dealt with, um, you know, Mark LePage, you know, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, why don't we talk a little bit about – your interactions with coach LePage who at this year, at this point is going to be in this, you know, elevated from kind of being a student coach into more of a active role. Uh, what were your dealings like with Mark? Yeah. Mark was, was, uh, the bench coach when we were there. And, and, um, I don't think at that time, Mark probably wasn't that much older than us. I don't know if he would, you know, he might've been mid twenties kind of thing at the time. And, and so he's only a few years older than us, but, um, yeah, he was a bench coach and, you know, he was kind of the the joker on the team, and and you could kind of, you know, if you're pissed off at somebody else or you're pissed off at one of the coaches, he was kind of the guy you could kind of talk to off the record, kind of thing. And and you know, and, and Mark, similar to Wayne, it kind of had that soft spoken demeanor. Now he could all he could get, you know, ramped up and and get fired up for sure too. But um, yeah, he was more of that calming voice on the bench, and and. Uh, he was more that guy, like I said, you'd go to to kind of have that off the off the cuff kind of conversation, and uh, yeah, and then I don't know how long, much longer than he took over the team, and and uh, yeah, so it's he's, he's a tried and true Badger, that is for sure. He was yeah. on the original. It's kind of like Brock is a little bit like the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? We have three coaches in thirty years. Yeah, that's, that's all of that were on the same staff, you know, yeah. to start. So, sure. um, let me ask you this: uh, you wouldn't have had great, you know, a lot of interaction with the pitching coach, but it brings us to the head coach, Jeff Lounsbury, and this is really his first year as a head guy, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, he's still pretty young. I mean, he he's obviously rocking the fashion sense that makes him <laughs> a little bit older, but uh, uh, Jeff's still a young guy, young coach in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, what were your impressions of Jeff? Yeah, Jeff was uh, so he coached me both years I was there, and, and like you said, it was his first year, and and uh, Jeff was definitely a, a no nonsense kind of coach, right? He he kind of expected perfection, and and um, he was fiery, definitely, right? I, I always uh, I got along well with Jeff, and um, but he was uh, he was a tough coach to play for at times, right? Very very driven, and and almost you know expected perfection, right? And um, yeah, we had a good relationship. He was, he was hard on you, but he'd also be the first one to, you know, kick you in the ass. And at the same time, the first one, if you, you made a great play, he's the first one giving you the high five off the dugout, right? And, and really passionate, really intense in the dugout. And, and, uh, you know, maybe a couple temper tantrums here and there. And I probably caused him a few temper tantrums with a few <laughs> errors, on, errors on defense, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, he was, he was hard on you, but he, at the same time, you know, he would, he'd be the first one giving you knuckle bumps or, Hey, that was a great play. And, 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 you know, just very passionate, right. Very energetic and, and, uh, you know, a nonstop, right. And it's funny because I bumped into, um, I bumped into Jeff last summer when he was involved with the, the Hamilton Cardinals IBL team. And, um, you know, one of the guys that was coaching with me, he's a little bit younger than me and he was kind of chirping me about on oh, Napper, you know, you were shit, blah, 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 back and forth. And, I said, oh, let's go talk to, to Jeff. Here is my coach from university. And so my buddy says to him, hey, you know, what was Napper like in, in, at Brock? And the kind of conversation went back and forth. And Jeff said, uh, in a nutshell, he basically said, he goes, yeah, like, you know, the guy could the guy could smash the ball. He could, he could hit the ball. He could pound it. He goes, defensively, he was a little bit uh, <laughs> suspect at times, right? And, and I looked at my buddy, and I kind of said, yeah, he's pretty much hit the nail on the head, you know, like. I, uh, I could hit and defensively I had a few lapses here and there, but yeah, it was nice seeing him. I hadn't seen him in a long time and shot the shit for a while. So 
Jeff, all I got to say is being a pitcher, you can't win a game 0-0, zero, zero, right? That's true. Like this is, you know, so it's a game of balance and you need yep. people that can hit the ball. So tell me a little bit about your first season. Are there any highlights that stand out for you? Obviously, you've talked a little bit about Kemp sticking the, the pin in your first home run, but yeah. um, <laughs> I'm sure you hit more, you know, you, you know, look, you, you, you could kill the ball. Uh, tell me a little bit if there was some personal highlights that you remember from 96. Um, just getting the opportunity to play and, and kind of hitting in the middle of that lineup with, you know, some absolute stud ball players, right? Bots at the top and Grant Giffen was a great ball player, Colin, you know, Nish. Um, you know, we just had guys that could just break all the time. And, and I usually kind of, Matty Fletcher, I think I kind of always hit in that fifth, sixth hole. And, you know, and I wasn't used to that, right? Coming from Hamilton where I always hit third or fourth. And, and uh, but then after watching these guys play for a while, you know, realizing, holy shit, these guys can, can pound the ball, right? And, and just being given that opportunity to play basically from day one, kind of hit in the middle of the lineup behind some of those guys was just, it was awesome. Great experience. Um, got to the finals. You know, at the time, you know, looking back, it was a tough loss and it was a heartbreaker, right? But, um, you know, met a lot of great guys. We had, had a really good year. We we were very competitive. We, you know, we, we won a lot of games and, and it was just, it was a really cool experience. And I didn't really know going into Brock. I didn't really know what to expect. And a lot of uncertainties kind of OUA ball was fairly new on the, on the scene and, you know, at that time, baseball in Canada was just starting to grow at the university level. And so it was kind of cool to be a part of that early, early stages of it. And, um, yeah, we had a, a awesome year, the, the road trips and, and piling into the 12 seater vans, you know, with 12 guys and one of the coaches driving and, you know, stinking it up and, and the double headers and, uh, you know, going down to the States, um, I think we got to meet uh, Ernie Witt was coaching the uh, somewhere in Michigan. I can't remember the name of it, but playing like, you know, Erie community and trips to St. Bonaventure and Niagara and Canisius, you know, it was just a really cool experience. So. Yeah. I mean, and you know, like it's, I've said it before, I think um, we all carry our own, own memories from that you know you may have an individual at bat but i think one of the things that stands out for everybody is the quality of ball in canada was a little bit shocking right when you get to a mcmaster or u of t i think would, those two teams would have been still standing out yeah. um, those weren't easy games you know they weren't they just no. these are teams that had great players on them yep um, you know, tell me a little bit about what your reflections are playing some of the stateside teams but also you know, those great McMaster, Brock, it's the start of that rivalry and you got to feel it like right away. Yeah. You just, you, you knew playing Mac was, and again, a lot of the guys on that team, um, Fortuna and guys like that, that I played against a lot, you just knew they, they had that draw too, right? And, and so there was kind of that, you know, rivalry that was building partly because you, we knew all the same players, right? They knew us, we knew them. A lot of us came from the same area, and um, so you could feel it. And they were always intense games, and and you know always very passionate, and and it was kind of cool when we played in Hamilton and we'd come back and play at Burning Arbor Stadium, and and that was kind of where I did all my games, right? You know, growing up, and it's just a cool experience, right? You could feel the the intensity. They were always close games. They were always battles, um, and you knew it was going to be a fight, right? So we just. You, you, you can always feel that tension, right? Playing them. So, yeah, it, it's, you know, they obviously a, a program that has got close ties to, to Brock. You're just down the road. And um, it's funny, they see the Brock Badger program as corporate and like a machine, and everyone was expected to be the same. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the Mac program, funny enough, for a school that had super high entrance marks, was kind of like this gang of, <laughs> vagabonds you know they yeah. they just they would drink all night and then show up to the park and kick ass you know and and um were a lot less formal i mean don graves obviously put in some, there were a lot of standards but 
Right. Um, I don't know. You know, it's just like, it's a weird dichotomy, mm -hmm. right? Because if you were to align, Ham Hamilton kind of has that reputation, but St. Catharines doesn't exactly have the reputation of being Toronto, you know, like no. U of T would be the place where you'd have the machinery and the, uh, the kinds of people that taking medicine or whatever that uh, might, might fill that. Um, yeah, Jeff, I, still, I, still, I still see it now with being with the Cardinals for so long coaching, you know, when we play other, uh, other areas, Hamilton definitely has that reputation, that blue collar, you know, excuse me, Mike, just that blue cow, blue collar kind of toughness, right? You're going to, you might win the game, but you're going to, you're going to earn it. Right. And I've tried to always kind of coach that with my kids, right? Yeah. Make them work for it. We might lose, but they're going to, uh, they're going to have to work at it to beat us. Right. So, yeah. So I did, 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 you know, I think that the culture is important. The Brock culture was an accountable one. in in my estimation, you know, you had to very much yep. be, be in shape and perform for your, your fellow teammates. Um, do you have any specific memories of playing in the U S that, uh, that stand out for you in 96? And we'll talk about uh, the nationals here shortly, but uh, yeah. Uh, I just remember, you know, going down there and, and doing the tours of the school and seeing their diamonds and their facilities. And, you know, at that time with, with Brock, we just didn't have it, right? It was it was new and it was up and coming. And, you know, we thought about how nice it would be to plan these, you know, beautiful diamonds, St. Bonaventure with, you know, the mountains in the background and just beautiful campuses, um, even the, you know, Erie Community College and these small schools that had great indoor facilities and, you know, just really cool where, you know, I always find that when you go down to the States, you baseball's massive down there, right? When you, we've done the tournaments and you go down there and, you know, that's their culture, right? Just, and to be able to kind of bring that up to Canada, I think would be awesome, right? If we could get these facilities that are in the States where you've got the, you know, the complexes with four diamonds and they're all turf fields and beautifully manicured and they're spotless. Like, you know, to be able to bring that, something like that up to Canada, I think would be amazing. And, and, you know, I think we're slowly getting there. I think we're, you know, we're building on it, but just the, that kind of stood out the, and, and the caliber, right. You're going down there and you're playing, you know, their JV teams and, you know, just no weaknesses. Right. And that's for a uh, upper state New York type school. Right. And, and, you know, you get further South and, you know, the talent just keeps getting higher and higher. So yeah, it was, it was a really cool experience. Uh, it's scary. I, 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 Brock's got the perfect conditions for it. It's just a matter of the will. Like they have the, there's the land on the campus to, to do it. There's no football program that they need to fund. Um, mm -hmm. I think it just comes down to having some vision and uh, a bit of leadership that is going to, come out of the woodwork to say, you know, baseball is our staple. It is our unique draw for athletes. Um, they've always built it around rowing and wrestling and, um, yeah. and those are great, but you know, they're also niche sports in the grand scheme of things and yeah, baseball's sure. more mainstream and they got the conditions. They're all there. I mean, community yeah. park, you know, is a, is a, is a great park, like, you know, in general, but you have mm -hmm. to travel there yeah. And uh, it's not the same as having something on campus. Yeah, we um, just get up, roll out a res, and walk over to the diamond and start playing, right? So yeah, or you roll out, and there's a a, a hitting tunnel there, or you know, with yeah. a pitching machine. Because as you know, a batting practice is hard if you got to go. <laughs> pitchers don't like doing anything, so you know, at yeah. the end of the day, it's <laughs> it's kind of like you know, I don't really want to throw batting practice. I'm sorry, I'm a diva. Yeah. I have to get my nails manicured today. Um, you know, you it's that kind it. of, you, you said it, not me. <laughs> I, I freely admit it. You know, it's, uh, um, it's just par for the course. It is a different, and, and we'll talk about this when we get down to coaching, but the, the difference between players and pitchers is that playing is a, is, is a team kind of a grind exercise. It's like running marathons. Mm -hmm. Pitching is like running the hundred meter dash. And we, we've all seen in the Olympics, what those sprinters are like. They, they pound on their chest. They try to psych the other person out. They, they're very high maintenance. They have, you know, their own coaches. They're, they're just these unique because it's a performance based scenario and you need a different mentality to thrive in it. Because if you can rise to the occasion as a performer, um, 
you know, you'll be a great pitcher, but if you're a person that gets a little bit nervous or, or trepidatious in the moment, it'll eat you up. Yeah, well, because, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is the only position where your replacement is literally right over your shoulder, warming up in the bullpen and, you know, yep. Yep. that you could be, you could suck and you're gone and you've let your teammates down and like it's, it's a really a big obligation because it comes with a lot of pressure. And oh, for sure. I yeah, think, hey, I, yeah, I think hitters can lean on each other, right? If one guy strikes it, the next guy can kind of pick him up and you kind of mm-hmm. forget it because you're going to get two or three more cracks at it. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's pretty interesting from that perspective. Yeah, you guys sure. have a really good year. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the thing, highlights along the way is you get to play in the Sky Dome. And uh, had you done that before? Or was that your first time playing in the Dome? Oh, first time. Yeah. It was uh, my, uh, I went, well, fast forward a whole, you know, 10, 15 years later, my nephew played there and I went down and my son got to be the bat boy for his team. And uh, yeah, it was a cool experience. I mean, you know, at that time, Sky Dome was the place to, to go, right? And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a cool experience for sure. Like the, the Mac guys have talked about them, you know, they, they went up to the outfield wall and they all took turns imitating Devon White's kind of oh, like yeah. Yeah. spinning yeah, we catch weren't, we, weren't, we weren't far after that. Yeah, that wasn't. <laughs> It wasn't that long before that, which is crazy. Yeah. I was actually at that game. I was actually at that game live, believe it or not. And, you know, in your opinion, it was a triple play? I, I wish I could say, but uh, so my dad had, uh, he'd called in sick and went, at that time there was no stub up. So you had to go to the ticket office and wait in line. And then we went and we bought tickets. And of course they were sold so fast that we had kind of an obstructed view of the, the stadium where we okay. were. And I was so far, we were so far up and we couldn't even see the Jumbotron. We couldn't, basically couldn't see Devon White. We could see everything else. We couldn't <laughs> see him the field. So we, we saw the hit, we saw the ball flying and then the crowd erupted and, and uh, we're thinking, what the hell, you know, we didn't have cell phones. What the hell happened? And had to wait till we got home to watch the replay on sports desk. So. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Ted and I uh, tell a story in our podcast about camping out uh, to get tickets for the ALCS and the world series. And, yeah. and, um, you know, people forget that that was a real big wave of baseball at that point. Right. So it was cool to be a baseball player. The sport was hot and enrollment was up, you know? Yeah. So that brings us to, you know, it's, it's great that you got to play there. Um, you know, we, we, Ted and I put those games together. So you guys played, uh, I think Durham college and yeah. uh, Mac played U of T yeah. and, uh, you know, real good showcase for Canadian baseball talent, I think, from that perspective. Um, so you guys have nationals and you're hosting them in St. Catharines. Yep. Um, and, you know, maybe rather we'll take a different slant than, you know, a lot of people. Um, not just your memories of it, but, you know, look, at one of the realities is you're playing late fall baseball. It's colder mm-hmm. than hell out there. Yep. You're using aluminum bats. How hard was it as a power hitter to hit under those conditions? Because the pitching oh. tended to dominate at nationals all the time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's just the nature of playing ball in Canada, right? And and we we have such a short window here with good weather, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure pitchers don't love pitching when it's cold and you're you know everything tightens up a bit. But yeah, I mean you you hit one off the end of the bat or you get jammed and you're your hands are ringing for forever right and and yeah definitely a grind you know definitely uh playing in that weather i think it actually one of the days or was actually snowing like flurries you know not that it accumulated on the ground but snow flurries and thinking everybody had the toques on and the hand warmers and yeah it was it was but for late october it was abnormally cold it felt a lot colder than normal <laughs> so i mean nowadays it's it's feels like it's warmer later in the year, but yeah, it, I remember being really, really cold there and, and you just got to fight through it. Right. It's, it's tough to not ideal hitting conditions, not ideal pitching, you know, conditions, but uh, yeah, it was tough. But one of the unique facets was that your games are covered on television. Kojiko would cover your games on television. So, you know, I think there was a, you know, I always like cracking out that line from a movie, you know, you're a local minor celebrity, but, um, yeah. you know, like it must've been a pretty special feeling to be on campus and be part of the team at this point. Cause it's starting to attract a lot of attention. And 
Um, yeah, for sure. Bit, what was it like being on campus and, you know, you'd walk around and, you know, I know how the baseball team was because I was one of them. Uh, you know, you'd wear a little part of your gear and people would know that you were part of the team, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, that that pride, right? My, you know, to walk around and be part of a, you know, in my opinion, a top two or three team in the in the country. And, you know, to be part of that and, and contribute and be on that team. Yeah, you and, and rightfully so. You should, you know, wear that with pride and walk around. And, um, you know, my niece goes to Brock now and she's on the women's volleyball team. And, you know, they're stacked. They made it to nationals this year. And, um, yeah, so I always tell her it's a, it's cool, you know, embrace it. Cause if you're there for two years, five years, whatever it is, you know, it's a, it's a cool experience. And you, like you said, you, you kind of mentioned it, but you could, you could feel that momentum building, right. You could feel the program getting stronger and, you know, getting new players in and you could just kind of feel that momentum going. So to kind of be part of that early stages of it was, was pretty cool. Right. But yeah, definitely walked around with a bit of swagger for sure. I think most <laughs> well, of the guys I- did. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think we we all saw the benefits sometimes when we would go to a bar and get some attention from some pretty lovely ladies as a result of being on the ball team. Um, yeah, and you all well, you traveled in the little packs, right? You always had your yeah, pack yeah. of four or five guys, and, and everybody kind of took care of each other. And if there was, if you had an issue with one guy, you had it with everybody, right? So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think I told that a very early podcast where we had been at Front Fifty Four in Thorold and we were there with about 12 of us and um, a guy came onto the, onto the dance floor and hit his girl, his ex-girlfriend over the head with a beer bottle. So <laughs> that was not good for him because there were 12 yeah. rock baseball players that just all started trying to punch at once. And yeah. uh, thankfully there, there was huge bouncers there that made us look small. Oh, yeah. They threw us around and took him out of there. But um, you know, it was that mentality. It was, yeah. You know, you could always count on a teammate, um, whether it was to catch up on some work or to borrow their work at, on occasion. You know, there was a lot of yeah. that kind of oh, yeah. camaraderie that carried it beyond the field, right? So um, for sure. it makes for a really great university experience where you can, you know, you have a built-in scenario where you have 20-odd friends. And uh, Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, always, always somebody... Somebody there with you, right? Kind of that pack mentality. So, yeah. So tell me about, okay, as we get out of 96 and now you're heading into your second year, what kinds of things did you do in the summer to prep for, um, you know, where you're working, playing, doing both? Yeah, I was, I was playing with the, uh, the junior Cardinals. So I was only, I was only 18 when I started, uh, at Brock. So I would have been, I would have been 19 the following summer after my first year. Um, so still playing junior Cardinals and, um, that was a full slate. We had a pretty jam-packed schedule. And then um, I was actually fortunate enough to get a job with the city of Hamilton with their um, parks commission, parks unit kind of thing. And I always thought how awesome it would be. My parents lived just down the street from Bernie Arbor. And I thought, how cool would it be if, you know, I could get a job at the city and work there. And That's exactly what happened. I got a job at the city and they put me at Mohawk Sports Park. And at that time, there was only... They were building, there's uh, three diamonds in the back now, kind of near the quad, the arena. But at that time, there was only four diamonds on the complex. So you had the stadium and then three other diamonds. And uh, fairly quickly, my foreman at the city was a great guy. And he knew that I loved baseball and I was all into it. And so he, you know, a month or so into the job there, he said, okay, I tell you what, your, your job every day is to groom, chalk, and put the bases out on the four diamonds. And you're here from seven to three. If that takes you eight hours or that takes you two hours, that's what you need to get done every single day. So I would, you know, get on my big tractor and I'd groom the diamonds and I'd chalk them and throw the bases out and had my Walkman in and off I went. And it was, it was a great job. So I did that all summer and I was in charge of grooming. I didn't have to cut the grass. I just had to, you know, rake the diamond, make sure they were all groomed properly. And so in terms of, you know, chalking out the lines and the batter's boxes, I could, you know, head that down to a T, right? I had it mapped out and I could get those things done and had those diamonds looking mint at the time, right? So uh, that's a, that's got to be one of the best jobs ever for someone who loves baseball as much oh, as you do. That's it was great. awesome. And I'd go around and all my buddies that were working in the city, you know, they'd come by and, we'd, you know, have a coffee and then I'd go chalk a diamond and have it done. And 
I think the boss said, he says, you're not leaving till three, but you, uh, <laughs> you got eight hours to get it done. So I don't care how you do it. Right. So by three o'clock, those diamonds look mint every single time. That's great. And, uh, yeah. you know, so you, you come in and, you know, back for 1997. Yeah. Has there been turnover on the team again? You know, is it a different team from year to year or was there a better carryover? Yeah, a pretty strong carryover. There was definitely a few, um, a few changes, uh, not any drastic ones, kind of a, maybe a handful of players, but for the most part, the, the similar core um, back. Um, at this point, Lounsbury had kind of moved me over to first base, so I was kind of playing a bit of first at this point with, you know, Grucci and, and Colin was there. And uh, so we were kind of playing first base, a little bit of third DH in. Um, but yeah, we had a, for the most part, a lot of the same same players back. So it was kind of nice to have that going into second year that, you know, you, you knew the players and everybody got along and, and um, kind of wanted to run it back and, and, you know, try to try to win it all that year. So. Yeah. And super intense year in terms of the, the rivalry with McMaster, because this is now getting into a two of three playoff to get through to the, uh, to the nationals. And, um, you know, anything else that stands out in your 97 year where, you know, just in terms of memories or crazy stories you might have from uh, your second year? Well, they kind of all blend together, you know, and, and um, <laughs> yeah, no, nothing that's, that stands out. I mean, the same type of things. I think we did the U.S. a little bit here and there. And, uh, you know, again, just same coaching staff, a lot of the same players. And it was just kind of, uh, yeah, building off that first year, my first year anyways, building off. A lot of the guys uh, were going into their third year, so yeah. uh, I was going into my second year. So it's kind of a, you know, building off a really strong year and just trying to keep it keep that momentum going. Well, that's that's exciting for sure. And and now we're starting to see, I believe, in your third year, there's a team at Western, and uh, or your yeah. second year, I think the third year of the league is now a team at Western, and they would, uh, you know, traveling to London is a Yep. Longer haul for you guys. And, yep. um, you know, Guelph, you end up- uh, Waterloo. Yeah. There's probably, probably eight or nine teams in the league at that point. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Like in the, at least in the Western side of it, there was a, you know, there's 16 teams nationally in the second year. Right. And so you're seeing growth in Queens and York and these kinds of places too. So, yeah. um, but still clearly the big rival for you guys is McMaster. Yeah, for um, sure. It's a funny thing I wanted to ask about is McMaster had a rather cantankerous uh, assistant coach named Henry, Henry Romanowski, who used to yep. get into it with Matt Fletcher a lot. Tell me a little bit about what the Brock players thought of Henry. And uh, I want to say that uh, did Henry have a couple of kids? I believe he had a few sons, maybe that were similar age to me. I felt like I played against a couple, and I just remember if it's the guy I'm thinking of was very heated and Fletch was definitely like one of those guys that if you chirped them, you were going to get it back. Right. He, <laughs> you know, he was going to give it back to you. And, and um, yeah. And if it's the guy that I'm picturing, he was, uh, yeah, we definitely had some, some <laughs> chirping. He was very opinionated and, and yelling and screaming and always John. And, and I don't remember, I don't remember what brought it on with Fletch, but I'm sure, he was chirping. I'm sure Fletch gave it right back to him and, and shove it right back in his face. And uh, yeah, and I, I believe we, I, I want to say that I played against his kids. I, I believe I thought he was like a Dundas guy or maybe I'm, maybe I'm off base here, but uh, yeah, I, I totally remember the name and, and I remember playing against, I think it was his kids and I remember them being kind of chirpy, <laughs> you know, heated games, if you, if you will. Yeah, well, the, certainly the Mac Brock thing was, and it's 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 so contradictory to some of the players, right? Like I, Doug Lunny and and Brad Reeson, I, I know them very well, and, and very yeah. respectful, kind of quiet um, guys that just did it on the field a lot. But um, there was yeah. an edge to the rivalry that um, was, it transcended the players, you know, from that perspective. Mm-hmm. The, the players were generally, my experience with the Brock guys was they were respectful, even though they could be very competitive, you know, I never knew them to cross yeah. that line and do things that um, would be 
you know, as a coach or as a player, we've all played with guys that stepped over the line, right? Whether it was Mm -hmm. abusing an umpire, whether it was getting into it for no real good reason with the team, with the the other team. And uh, I've never known anyone, you know, personally or in in the guise of competition from, from either squad that um, would go out to purposely kind of incite that it just happens kind of yeah. organically sometimes and i think it's because yeah. those two teams knew they had to go through each other to to win well, i mean i mean you're you're 18 19 year old boys right that's what's gonna happen you could uh any little thing could kind of spark that and, and then the fight's on and the chirping's on right and and i see it now with the guys i'm coaching right it's one little comment and then things steamroll right so yeah i think it was you know, there was that mutual respect there. Like, the, you're bang on. They were a they were a great team. They had a lot of great players on that team, and you knew you knew you're gonna have to go through them, and vice versa, right? So it just it brought on a really you know really good strong rivalry. And I, you know, personally, I don't have a, an issue with it. I think that's healthy for the players as long as it's you know within reason. But I think that that healthy drive and kind of push each other. I think that's great for the sport whatever sport you're playing. I, I think it's a, it's great to, to have that, that energy and nothing better than being part of it. You no, know, it's a different feeling when you're getting into the vans to go up to Bernie and, uh, mm-hmm. and similarly when they were coming, coming, you know, it's just, you know, cause in Canada at that time, still, it was a bit of an uneven field, right? Some of the teams were pretty weak yeah. and yeah. you had a handful of teams that were really good. And, and, um, you know, when you just have a different mentality, it's more business-like yeah. when you're going to a place where, you know, you're, you're really the objective is to go be good, but you're probably going to come away with two wins as yeah. opposed to, you know, these are the games that are going to separate, you know, separate us from um, those other teams. And we've got to go win one or just at least yeah. put our foot down and say, you will not beat us today. So super cool that you, you yeah. got to live through that experience. Unfortunately, you know, in, in 97 is, uh, Matt got you guys and, uh, you know, it was my old, uh, best friend and, and may you rest in peace, Brad Reeson, that got you guys in the, in his last at bat. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I wish I would have been, you know, been close, more closely connected to the program at that point, because I, I would have just said to Jeff, walk him. You know, yeah, yeah. I had seen Reeson's yeah. act for so many years and it was the same ending every time it doesn't matter how hard you throw how good you are when that guy's dialed in it's gonna be in a gap or in this case yeah. out of the park so you guys couldn't have lost to a better player um yeah but it must have been must have smarted again to get so close oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure and i think i knew at that point you know when we lost we got knocked out then that you know i had kind of known inside that I probably wasn't coming back for a third or fourth year. So, um, you know, there was the, you know, do I go back and play junior? Do I go try to play IBL and Hamilton and that kind of stuff? And um, so it's kind of that bittersweet where almost a little bit of me kind of probably knew that was maybe my last game, you know, or at that level, right. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe I could, you know, and I did, I went back and I kept playing junior ball, but, um, don't get me wrong, I had a blast doing that up till I was 21, but um, yeah, it never, it, did, it didn't have that same feel, right? So there's probably a little bit of me that probably took that a little bit harder because I, deep down inside, I probably knew, you know, that I wasn't coming back and that, that was kind of the last, my last kick at it with Brock, right? So yeah, it was tough for sure. Yeah. So tell me how that, you know, that motivates obviously a new chapter in your life. And, and yeah. um, so what happens after the season, Jeff, and, and, what what's next on your journey? So I uh, I finished out the year, finished out my second year there. So that would have been ninety seven, ninety eight. Uh, um, we don't need to get into it, but I would say I didn't have great marks. I'll put it. I'll leave it at that. And uh, so at the end of the year, uh, I remember going home and, and sitting down with my parents and kind of thinking, you know, where do I go from here? And I'm probably not going back to Brock. And um, my dad was a police officer. I had a few uncles that were police officers and it was always something that I had kind of always had in the back of my mind, something that I would maybe consider. And, you know, I remember sitting down with my dad and kind of got the old school, you know, well, you're not going to, 
just sit around here on your ass doing nothing. So you better come up with a game plan, right? And and uh, yeah, it was always something I'd consider. And I um, so I applied to Mohawk uh, with the Police Foundations program. Um, I got in that following January, so that would have been January of '99. Uh, and I took a uh, and it was a at that point they offered an 18 month course, so right through the summer. And I ended up graduating in June of 2000. And uh, those last four or five months of the program is where they were really trying to push you. At that point, there was a huge hiring, you know, on the go. There was a lot of vacancies throughout the departments. And uh, so I started applying probably January of that year, January of 2000. Um, applied to a whole bunch of services. And I got hired that spring. And I started uh, started my policing career June of 2000. Off to the police college I went for the summer of 2000. So uh, it's pretty, it's pretty quick, yeah. but you know, it feels, really quick. it feels like you're very focused, right? Coming out of all of this stuff, it's just a, a like a hard march to this is where I'm going and it's kind of yeah. in my blood. And it probably felt pretty, uh, I think probably felt pretty good to feel like you were moving forward. Are there other chain, like, and, and so you go to police college, you get, you know, hired on your hometown force. Is that how no, that I, I got hired in Halton. So I applied to uh, Hamilton, Halton and Peel at the time, kind of all with, within that same area. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll kind of go to wherever. And I, I went through a lot of the, the interviews with Hamilton. Um, at that time you could get interviewed with one service. And if you, you know, if you pass two or three of the interviews and then you've, you know, you, you failed at that point, the other services could kind of, pick up from that point, if you will, right. And carry on. So I had interviews with all three and, um, Hamilton basically said no, and just said, we think too young. And just at that point, I was only 22, not even 23. And Hamilton just said, no, like we think just a little bit too young. Like we like it, but this and that. And then probably a month later, Halton offered a spot and, um, yeah, I jumped at it. So my dad was, you know, was a Hamilton cop and, and that's kind of where I always saw myself going to. Um, but I just kind of blasted out everywhere. And so Halton hired me and then, uh, so I was there, uh, summer of 2000 and then my brother, he got hired on with Hamilton fall of 2000. So we actually went back to back at the police college. And, uh, you know, after about four or five years, I thought about transferring back to Hamilton just cause that was my hometown. And that's where I, but at that point, you know, in Halton, I, you know, had a bit of seniority building up and was getting courses and trained up on a, you know, a number of different things. And, and, uh, so I just thought, you know, for my best, you know, for personal reasons, I just stayed in Halton and here I am almost 25 years later and still plugging away at it. So it's amazing. Yeah. It's crazy. Now policing is not an easy, uh, career choice because of shift work and, on work stress and these kinds of things, um, you know, because there's some, some things that happen that are not standard, you know, it's not a standard blow up at the office kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, how would you, you know, what advice would you give to someone that's entering law enforcement at this point? Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you'll have learned a lot, I assume in that, that time span. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I think I went into policing with a, my eyes wide open, you know, and talking to my dad and my uncles and, and I, you know, I felt like I had a pretty good base, you know, pretty good foundation to, to go on. And I had, you know, strong family support with my parents and my siblings and my, my current wife and, um, you know, very supportive. So, um, it was just, uh, I went into it eyes wide open. Right. And, and I'm sure if you talk to my dad from, the early seventies to 2000, you know, policing changed drastically, you know, and here we are now from 2000 to 2024, I'm saying the same thing, right? Policing has changed dramatically, right? Technology, everything seems to change. Um, the biggest thing I would say, you know, in, in the 24 years is you can't, anybody that's looking to get into it now as a, as a young person, you can't, it can't be your job 24 seven, right? And, and, and I'm guilty of that. My current position, um, a lot of times we'll be sitting at home watching a show or something at nine, 10 o'clock at night. And I'm answering work emails and people are texting me for work, just the, the unit that I do now. And, um, you gotta have that escape 
And for me, it was coaching baseball where I could get to diamond and all the bullshit that was going on at work. I could leave it behind. And, and uh, so just having that separation right between your personal life and your work life, cause it can, they can kind of bleed together. And I feel like that's kind of when you, when you experience problems, right. Being able to shut off the work side of it and, and just focus on your personal life. So. Which brings us to, you know, I mean, policing is obviously a little bit um, of a team environment, you know, very yep. similar to being on a ball team. Is there anything that you would have learned from your time at Brock that you apply to um, your career? It's it's funny because I, um, I've always said, you know, my last two or three years in policing, I would love to go and work in our recruiting unit and interview people that are new to the job and and sit down and do an interview with them because one I think I could been on long enough that I think I could read through the bullshit and if they're they're bullshitting me and the guys that I work with now um are are pretty experienced and and switched on guys they've been on for a long time and we always have this debate that you know in my opinion the the best cops out there are the guys that played rep sports, high level rep sports, especially team sports. And, and I think it's a number of reasons, right? It, 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 when you play a high level rep sport, you have to have that commitment. You have to be driven, self-driven, you know, some sort of athletic ability or or strength. You you need to have focus. There's so many, to me, there's so many factors that go into playing at a high level rep sport. And it doesn't matter what sport it is, baseball, basketball, football, it doesn't matter. Um, I think you can take that and, and policing and just life in general, right? You can be part of a team and you can work well with others and, you, you know, and you can read through kind of that bullshit and, and be part of a team. And that's what, you know, when you go to the college, that's the big thing, right? The, the teamwork environment. And, you know, this is one, the police are one team. So if you can't work well with this person, it's, it's not going to work, right? We have to have each other's back. And we talk about, you know, going to Isaacs with four or five of the ball players, right? You had each other's back. And sometimes it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. That's just what you got to do, right? So I've definitely seen how they kind of trans. And I always think, you know, my last two or three years before I retired, I think it'd be cool to go in and, and talk to these kids that are coming out of just finishing playing maybe Brock baseball, right? And And knowing what I've gone through, what they've gone through, hopefully – you know, it's kind of a similar career path. So it's amazing to hear that because it, it's, uh, it's very true. I mean, team dynamics are a struggle in most cultures and, and, uh, you know, I think rep sports, um, allows you also to be, it's funny, laid back when you're watching your kids play. I talk a lot about Chris Gucci and I watching our daughters play hockey. Yep. And you know, because you've played that first off, if your kid's out on a hockey rink, yeah. they can't hear you yelling from the stands anyway. So it doesn't yeah. matter how loud you are. They're not going to hear you. Yeah. And if you bang on the glass and you make a sideshow of yourself, your kid is not going to appreciate that as motivation. They're going to be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And so I found that a lot of high level athletes are really laid back as parents and they're, they just let their kids do their own thing and not get too involved and, Um, you know, and and probably as a coach, you know, also because you've been there and done that, you know, there's, there's a tolerance for some of the, you know, the nuances of it. It's, it's, you know, we know how hard it is to be even a varsity athlete. Only 6% of, um, people who play rep in this country go on to play varsity. So that's, that's a small number. That's, you know, less than one person or maybe it's one or two people on an entire team of rep players. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you just have a, a good perspective. You know, we know that our kids are likely not going to the play on the Stanley cup winner. We know yep. that they're not going to be likely towing the mound in game one of the world series. Yeah. Because we also know what, it, how exceptional the great players are. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I think it, it, it just gives some perspective and it allows you to be understand that the lessons that you learn are going to influence your life and your career. And how, what if you're a good husband or if you're a good father or you're a good employee or a good business runner or a good teacher, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really cool that you'd want to bring that into policing, which, you know, um, 
I think is underestimated as a career, right? Like a lot of people tend to get caught up in the politicization of policing, but the reality is most police officers, men and women are really great contributing members of the community. They yeah. work a lot with youth. Um, it's not easy doing their job because, you know, do you think it's pleasant to want to go tell someone to not do something? Yeah. Um, you know, and so you have to have a lot of patience, but the biggest thing you need is a supportive family. You know, yeah. It's, uh, because you you work shift and there's, there's things that go with that. So talk yeah. about, you know, the greatest home run you've hit, which is a family. Yeah. Uh, talk about that a little bit, Jeff, and the importance of yeah. family in your life. So I, I think I better get this right. Been married 22 years, uh, <laughs> my wife, Kathy. So, um, yeah, we kind of knew each other in high school, but we kind of dated on and off, but nothing too serious. And then um, after university, we kind of rekindled and uh, yeah, we were married in, in 2002. And then um, in 05, I had my daughter, Emma, who's currently at Queens, not a baseball player, but uh, she is at Queens. And then my son, Easton, is in grade 11 and he's all about hockey and baseball. And, and it's funny because... So we named him Easton, which yeah, is, I was I was gonna say I know where that came. That's from. always the uh, that's always the million dollar question. I always get it from people. Oh, after the the hockey stick, and I say mm. no, kind of after the, the, the baseball, baseball bat. Yeah. That, right? <laughs> and I I don't know why I heard that name a long time ago, and and it's funny because some people say like, oh, that's a cool name, and then other people kind of look at you and go, oh, that's a that's an interesting name, right? And and it's a name that I always I always said if I wanted a boy or if I had a boy, that was the name I wanted to name him, and. So yeah, they're an awesome, awesome family. My wife's a teacher. Um, a lot of things I've done in my career, I wouldn't be able to do um, without their support. You know, we're supposed to work till six and then the phone rings and sorry, honey, I'll be home at midnight, right? And, and this call's on the go and um, yeah, and she's been fully supportive of that. So it's made my job a lot easier that I can, that I have that family support, my parents, my brother, my sister, all of them. Um, they're always there. and, and makes my life a lot easier. Right. And my friends and people I've met, um, I th we, we talk about our kids growing up when my son wanted to start playing hockey and I can't even skate. I'm horrible on the ice. I'm, I'm terrible. And I'll be the first one to admit it. And when he wanted to try out for the hockey team here and I said, go for it, buddy, you know, this is on you. And here we are 10 years later of him playing rep hockey. And, but I love it that I can just go to the arena. I don't have to get involved in everything. I can, grab my Horton's coffee and just watch them and, and sit back. And my daughter did, uh, got into the whole cheer sport. And, and I always say, you know, I, that's one of my favorite things to do is just go to an arena, a competition a ball and watch my kids play. I think that's, that's what, you know, I love doing right now. I'd rather do that more than anything else. So. Except that in six and a half months, you know, Daryl Kemp is going to come along, spit some tobacco juice on your shoe, and he's going to say, hey, Nap, this guy's fastball is really straight. You should be able to hit it out of the park at 365. That's exactly yep. what he'll say. Well, I hope I can. I hope I can. Or I hope I can at least make some solid contact. I'll just take that at this point. <laughs> well, I keep saying it, it might be the worst exhibition of baseball ever. We'll, we'll be sponsored by the St. John's ambulance for all the yeah, oxygen we need a couple, to do. A couple of uh, pulled groins, I'm sure, or pulled hamstrings along the way. <laughs> Well, I, it, you know, it's for a good, you know, it's really obviously we're doing things for a good cause and, uh, you know, for a couple of scholarships that uh, one we want to establish at Brock for incoming freshmen and, and the other one uh, to keep that McMaster program uh, able to retain great players in Canada. So, yeah, um, you know, that part we're really looking forward to. But, um, you know, which one of you, you know, you, you've did you maintain relationships with some of the guys you played with at Brock or is that, uh, um, or is there going to be a lot of, wow, I haven't seen you in so many years kind yeah, of moments. It'll probably be a lot of that. Uh, like I said, I'm still pretty good friends with Drew Arnold and, and Ronnie Strau. Um, they bump into Fletch every now and then at work or at ball <laughs> stuff. But, um, yeah, a lot of the guys that, you know, I kept in touch with a few of the guys after I left Grant Giffen a little bit and, and, uh, but he's last I heard he was out kind of Kingston Belleville way. Right. So, um, yeah, I haven't, uh, I've never been a big social media guy, Facebook insert. It never really was my kind of thing. So, um, kind of lost touch with a lot of guys that way. So yeah, a lot of it'll be that, Holy shit. I haven't seen you in a long time, but a lot of, a lot of guys like 
it'd be really cool to kind of reconnect with right so yeah really looking forward to that yeah it'll be it'd be fun and you know and now you know maybe your kids will get to see what you know outside of coaching uh you know as a player because we are all different as players i think they, they don't get to see that element you know i particularly warn my daughters they've they've got a warning label i'm like daddy's yeah. not like this true truthfully <laughs> yeah um, but you know look at they've got it because my daughter plays scholar she's on scholarship playing soccer and she is right. vicious right she's just yeah. exactly the same you put her on a she's so sweet off the field you put her on it's kind of like a different person i'm like oh I, yeah for sure yeah that's not my daughter you know <laughs> <laughs> um so Jeff, I'll just ask you a couple of other random questions that people might yep. not know. Did you have a face favorite baseball player growing up, or do you have one now that you, you kind of patterned yourself after, or really well, admired? I, I wouldn't say I patterned my my style after him, but without a doubt, um, still to this day, my favorite all time player was Kirby Puckett. Um, I was a never a big Blue Jay guy growing up. I kind of always never like cheering for the home dog or the home team. And um, yeah, Kirby Puckett in the late eighties, early nineties was just a, an animal, right. And kind of had that, that weird look, kind of the little shrunken uh, fat roly poly guy, but man, he could play. Right. So he was definitely my, and still to this day, my, my favorite ball player of all time. Love Kirby Puckett. Hall of Famer. I actually went down to the, the year that he was inducted. Me and my wife went down and, Drove down to Cooperstown and and went and watched him get inducted and cool experience. It was him, Dave Winfield, and uh, Bill Mazeroski. Wow, uh, in the hall. So it was a cool, which is a really cool experience, especially on the the Hall of Fame weekend. We we camped close by and, and had an awesome weekend. So much fun. Yeah, the people don't understand how beautiful it is in Cooperstown. Oh, it's just like that part of Upper New York State is is beautiful. Yeah, for um, sure. You know so. Okay, one last question. What is one thing that nobody would know about you that might surprise uh, all of your ex-teammates and soon-to-be teammates in about six and a half months? Is there something that you're like, yeah, this is something people wouldn't expect? Well, if you saw me now, I think you would. people would be shocked that I can do the worm. I think that would make <laughs> I could. I shouldn't say that. Maybe I... I used to be able to do the worm really, really well. Um, and every now and then, it's funny, my mother-in-law uh, got remarried uh, probably 20 years ago. And I was dating my wife at the time. We went to the wedding and, you know, I'd had a few few beverages and I busted out the worm in the middle of the dance. <laughs> and I think my wife was just stunned that I had <laughs> done this. And it kind of turned into the, the, you know, this like, circus act thing that I have to do now when I go to a wedding and I have to bust out the worm and that's fine when you're 25 or 30, but you know, 47 and things hurt a little bit more. So I still bust it out every now and then, but it, the older I get, the more it hurts when I do it. So Jeff, you are an honorary left-hander because you know, putting that out there means with <laughs> all of us that you're going to have to do this now, right? Well, or, yeah, or, yeah, I probably will. And I'll probably, I did it once uh, a couple of years ago. We were, the team I was coaching, we were in Baltimore and they had a, a coach little dance off stupid thing. And so of course I did the worm and one of the mums is a, is an RMT. And uh, I did the worm. And when I went down, I felt my one shoulder just kind of <laughs> collapse. And I went over to I remember saying to her, I'm like, Oh, I think I, I think I did something pretty bad here to my shoulder. And she kind of moved it around and cracked it and it was fine. But yeah, every time I do it now, I kind of cross my fingers when I do it. So. I know exactly, like, you know, I don't <laughs> think I'm the amazing Kreskin with this prediction, but I can see you doing the worm and then Kemp pulling you aside and going, nap, hey, nap. You could have done it a little quicker. Yeah, that was so. horrible. What, what, that was horrible. What are you doing? <laughs> Dead straight face and, and uh, no emotion, just straight face it, right? So. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Jeff. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. And listen, I'm, I'm, sure. we didn't get the opportunity to play together. It doesn't mean we're going to see each other in our primes here. But um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you in person in St. Catharines. And, um, you know, I think it would be a special weekend. We're celebrating really 30 years of Brock baseball, but, mm -hmm. you know, highlighting the people who helped get it off the ground. And yeah. um, It'd be exciting. So thank yeah, you so much no. for today. And it was no, really, really good to really, hear your really good to hear your story. Yeah. No, I really appreciate it, Mike. Thanks for doing all this and, and kind of 
get everybody back in touch and yeah, really, really looking forward to September. Should be a really fun weekend. Thanks, man. Have a great day. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Smith.